From Toronto, Canada, The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett from Zuma Radio, AM 740. Welcome to the Audio Imaginarium. Come on in, weary traveler. Hang your cloak on a peg, grab a stool, and come gather around the fire. There are stories to be told, and you are among friends. Gary Wayne, the author of The Genesis 6 Conspiracy, is standing by to talk about the return of the Nephilim, and he is with us for the full two hours. I can't wait to dive into this conversation. However, just a a few programming notes. My technical producer tonight is Duncan Briggs. Ryan White is the YouTube live stream producer. However, no live stream tonight. That returns next week, and the audio from this transmission will be available on the YouTube channel Strange Planet within the next few days. Before we get started, I want to wish all of my Canadian listeners a happy Victoria Day. And I also want to note the passing of Stanton Friedman, who died last Monday at the age of 84. Stanton was widely considered the grandfather of modern-day ufology and the first citizen investigator to research the UFO incident at Roswell, New Mexico. And he was passionate, tireless, and just a kind, gentle soul. And he will be missed. And uh, incidentally, I'm planning a tribute show for sometime next month. So keep checking the website, strangeplanet.ca, for details. There are giants among us, passing largely unnoticed, intent on carrying out a secret plan to enslave all humanity. They may not look like giants, but their bloodlines extend all the way back to the Nephilim, the offspring of fallen angels who mated with human women described in Genesis 6 when giants roamed the land. Gary Wayne, author of The Genesis 6 Conspiracy, How Secret Societies and the Descendants of Giants Plan to Enslave Humankind, details the role of modern-day Nephilim in Satan's plan to install the Antichrist at the end of days. Gary is a Christian contrarian who has maintained a lifelong love affair with biblical prophecy, history, and mythology. His extensive study has encompassed encompassed the Bible and Gnostic scriptures, the Quran, the Bhagavad Gita, Gilgamesh, and other ancient epics, language, etymology, and secret society publications. Gary, welcome to The Conspiracy Show. How are you? Doing very well and uh, so excited to be invited to to be on your show and talk about the the Genesis 6 conspiracy and everything anybody ever wanted to know about Nephilim. Well, there is so much to discuss. We'll try to squeeze as much as we can over the next two hours. Uh, For those not intimately um, informed on the Bible, what, what does Genesis 6 actually say about the Nephilim? It's a very, it's a very interesting uh, chapter because it comes right after the genealogies in Genesis five, and then it's a preamble to the flood story. So you have four unique, very almost odd verses in Genesis six one through four that describe the sons of God who are angels who go to the daughters of human females. Uh, have sex with them, take them as wives, and create the giants, as the King James Version uh, states, and Nephilim, as it is in other English translations, and noting that giant goes back to the Hebrew word nephil, and the I am is the male plural. And these were the demigods and the heroes of old and the men of renown, the mighty ones. And so we have this very interesting verse that is put in where the flood story is about to begin because right after this account it goes into the Noah account and the building of the ark and the flood that's coming and it is setting the context for why the flood comes but we're not provided any other details right there in Genesis in terms of the Nephilim it's just sort of inserted there and I know a lot of readers when they go through they read those verses probably their eyes bug out a little bit and then kind of keep on going because it's like, you know, what's that all about? So, but it has so much to do with what happens in the Bible that if you don't understand what is going on with the Nephilim and the angels and the angelic rebellion, so much of the Bible does not come into focus in, in the proper context is, is sort of overlooked. And is Genesis 6 the only place where the Nephilim are mentioned? 
Uh, Nephilim only shows up uh, in the Bible three times. Uh, in Genesis 6, where it says giants, and then Numbers 13.33, where, again, the word giant is used in the King James Version Bible, uh, where it's talking about the Anakim, who are Rephaim, who are said to be the descendants of giants in that passage. The other root words that, uh, where giant goes back to for all the other times in the Bible is the word Rapha or Raphaim, again for the male plural, just as these tribes that are showing up after the flood, and in De Deuteronomy 2 lists a lot of them, there are, are more beyond that, but tribes like the Anakim, tribes like the Emin, the Zamzuzim, the Avim, the Horim, and so many others are all giants and Rephaim and our different branches of the Rephaim. So technically, to answer your question, Nephilim only show up uh, for the most part before the flood, but then a distinct being that seems to be the same kind of being and perhaps from a second incursion or a different branch of the Nephilim uh, do show up after the flood and continue all of the way to the times of David in the Bible. And what about in the Apocrypha? Uh, it seems to me they're also mentioned in the book of Enoch. Yeah, once you get outside the Bible, that gets to be, again, a very, very common term. So first Enoch, which most people are aware of, is a very, very good book to read for additional context to the Angelic Rebellion and the Watchers. Of course, Watchers show up in Daniel 4, and I think those are the seraphim angels that have the, the serpents of a face, they're the fiery serpents as they translate back to seraph and seraphim again for the male plural. And you get the whole account of, of the Nephilim, of the creation in a lot more detail. And First Enoch runs very, very consistent with the Bible. It's got a few corruptions. We don't have the original manuscript uh, out of Hebrew. We have Aramaic and the, uh, the Giaz version of it that comes out of Ethiopia, and that's the longer version of First Enoch. But for anybody who wants to learn more about it, I would very much encourage them to read that book for the context, because because it runs very, very congruent with the Bible. And and is there any dispute? I mean, I, I know that you you gave us sort of the etymology of Nephilim in Hebrew, but still, there are those who argue, no, that's not what it meant. What do you say to those people? Well, and I think we need to respect everybody's point of view on these things. And what they tend to say is that these were just... Uh, the sons of Seth, and called the sons of God because they were the followers of God. Except that, you know, humans mating with humans aren't going to be able to create monsters or giants and or demigods because they had the immortal spirit that was passed on to them, which is why in Genesis 6-3, God steps in to limit all life to 120 years. It takes a few generations for that to kick in moving forward after the flood. But it does kick in, and that's in response to the creation of these sons of God who are taking human females to create these uh, Nephilim, who are called Gibberim, which are the mighty ones, and the men of renown, which is Shem and Shemaim, and Shemaim is the heavenly ones, and so they're the offspring of the heavenly ones. When we get into the definition of sons of God, a lot of people will jump in and say, well, wait a minute. You have the sons of God that are discussed in the New Testament. And the, the, that it's very much true that we as Christians and those you know, who are Christians are going to be adopted as uh, sons of God through the resurrection and because of Jesus' resurrection. And we're going to be adopted as his brothers and as sons of God. And we're actually going to uh, reign over and judge the, uh, the angels in, in the future time. The thing is, is though, that is after their re resurrection, so that's a future forward thing, and it has nothing to do with the sons of God in the Bible. So if you get into, let's say, Job 1, 6, 2, 1, 38, verses 4 through 7, you have the sons of God in the King James Version Bible, and many of the other English translations, it'll just simply say angels. And these are the sons of God who present themselves to uh, God in, in the throne of God, which humans have never done. And Satan accompanies, the, accompanies these angels, who, and Satan, of course, is you know the chief fallen angel of the rebellious angels in Job 1 and Job 2. And in Job 38, they are cheering on creation at the time of creation with the morning stars, and of course humans weren't there in 
in uh, the, the creation of the universe. And secondly, you have a whole host of other terms that are used to describe angels as in stars, as in morning stars in Job 38. You have the heavenly host, um, and they all support each other as being the same type of beings. And these rebellious angels are known as the gods in the Old Testament. And Psalm 82 talks about this council of ruling gods after the flood, so different from the ones that were before the flood because the impassioned ones are put into the abyss of Revelation 9. But everything in the Bible goes to discussing that these sons of God were actually angels and they created these giants. And we get an understanding of how tall these giants are because even after the flood and over a thousand years after the flood, you have Goliath, who is six cubits in a span. And that comes through as in modern English measurement, if you're using a common cubit at nine feet, nine inches or a royal cubit, which I would argue one should use because he would have been the king of Gath as a Gittite, and an avim, part of that Raphaim branch of giants after the flood, uh, that would have put him more to 11 feet 1 inches to 11 feet 3. And then King Og, and I won't go through the details of his measurements in his bed that was made of iron, uh, because wood would not be strong enough to take the weight, he was even taller still. And we think the Nephilim were somewhere between 20 and 40 feet, although wow. we don't know whether or not they were even larger than that, because when you get into first Enoch, you have two translations with a with a, a numerical value. So you have 300 associated with L's or cubits. And we don't know how big an L is, but if it was cubits that they're talking about, then it'd be over 450 feet tall. But Again, we don't have the original Hebrew, and we don't know what that original measurement was. So these were monsters, and they were not just tall. They were twice as wide and stocky. So where an average human would have a height-width ratio, let's say, of 3 to 1 on average, um, these Nephilim had 2 to 1. So these were dexterous warriors, fleet of foot, fleet of hand, uh, that became the demigods, and the original ones had that immortal spirit where the where the demons come from, and they would have they would have ruled uh, the ancient world, right? Oh, absolutely! I mean, just with their sheer size and warrior capabilities, and of course they were producing in numbers and were you know just increasing in population. They come along in. Enoch in the sixth generation, and in the Bible we understand that as the days of Noah, and Noah and Jared's uh, timeline overlap. So that remains quite congruent in terms of how that story goes. But yeah, they usurped all of the kingships of the antediluvian world, uh, enforced a universal polytheist religion in worship of the uh, pantheon of fallen angels, uh, and I think it's the same pantheon that was used all around the world, with just different vernacular names, both before the flood and then again after the flood. And also, you have these Raphaim beings, these giants that show up after the flood that are somehow related to the Nephilim, but somehow a little bit distinct just because they have a different root name. And again, Raphim goes back to the tribe of giants and or uh, deceased uh, spirits of the giants, uh, of the dead. And they also usurp the kingships and set up all of the royal dynasties around the world that we know of today. And when we look at the, the noble elite, they tend to take their genealogies back to these gods and these demigods that ruled after the flood. Now, let me just back up to uh, Genesis 6 again. Uh, because when we're talking about fallen angels commingling, I'll use that term because it's a family show, <laughs> commingling with the daughters of men, uh, most of us, I think, myself included, were sort of raised under the idea that angels, including fallen angels, are spiritual beings. And, you know, Ephesians talks about we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. So not against flesh and blood, but in order for a fallen angel to have relations with a human um, a female, wouldn't they have to be flesh and blood? 
Yeah, they most definitely would have to be, and that's one of those sort of nuances in terms of if we're going to take this this concept realistically, we have to be able to understand how they're able to, as spirit beings, create beings with uh, beings of, of flesh in the physical world. And I would start that, this understanding that these were not angels uh, is only about 200 years old and is the typical doctrine now that's taught in the seminary schools. But before that, it was always taught that these were indeed angels. And so if you read Josephus' account, who wrote the complete history of the Jewish people for the Romans after the diaspora and the war against the people of Judah in around 70 AD, when Jerusalem is destroyed, and so that their history won't be lost, he understood them as angels and these as giant monster beings, very similar to the beings that were called the Titans in Greek mythology or the heroes in Greek mythology and the giants in accounts around the world. So this was sort of the understood concept before the last couple of years, but that still doesn't explain how they're able to do this. What we do know is that when angels interact in this world, they tend to take a physical form. So we get many, many accounts in the Bible where they're depicted as men that you don't recognize as men. They, they talk, they eat, they touch, and they're very much physical. Some accounts where they're described as men, but they know somehow they're angels. You, we get descriptions of six-winged seraphim angels uh, in Isaiah 6. We get uh, angels like Gabriel coming down, uh, and talking to to beings in the in people in the New Testament, uh, whether it's Mary or Elizabeth or and, and others, in terms of interacting and touching, you get all sorts of watchers in in Daniel four. You in all of these descriptions have different physical traits to them, just as Satan is described as a dragon or a serpent in this world, and. These are not spiritual descriptions. These are physical descriptions. So what we learn from this is that somehow, some way, they are able to take on a physical form. And Jude 1.6 talks about leaving their habitat um, in heaven, and uh, you know where they lost their estate when they committed these crimes, and that's why it's linked to the abyss in uh, Jude 1.6. And that word, habitat, derives from oiketarian in Greek, and that's a dwelling place for the spirit. So they left the place of dwelling for their spirit, and seemingly they need a dwelling place in the physical world to interact. And as we understand this, this is, you know, taking a physical form. And if you can take a physical form, then you can add any sort of organs or parts that you want to do what you want. You can take any gender of your choice, which I think somewhat explains why you have uh, female gods and goddesses in the pantheon, so that I think many of the rebellious angels take a, uh, a, a feminine form in, 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 in this world to form the pantheon. We also get these satyr gods, these devil gods uh, that are talked about. Satyr shows up in Isaiah 13 and Isaiah 34, and I think these are the degraded physical gods after the rebellion, the ones who weren't put into the abyss, just as Azazel would also be described as the scapegoat or the goat god who was the leader of these angelic watchers and in the abyss. So I think they're all degraded just as Satan was degraded back to Satan's status after the rebellion as well. And these are the gods that are the ones that aren't in the abyss, the ones that are talked about in Isaiah 13 and Isaiah 34, and the devil gods that uh, they're worshipping. And I won't go into all of the minutia of where to find that in the Bible, but people want to get a hold of me, I, I can send those, those details to you. These are the gods that are the ruling council for the 70 nations coming out of Babel that are described in Psalm 82. Now, are there clues in the Bible as to when this actual commingling in Genesis 6 took place? Can we pinpoint exactly where the, the fallen angels landed? Was there a, a particular uh, village or kingdom? Well, biblically, we we're not told that they, you know, they come in a visit to do this. We're understood that these were the uh, the watchers 
who governed the physical world before the flood. Um, so what we understand is is that they were down um, and supposed to be helping humankind, but when they rebel, they commit these violations against the, the laws of creation. So we don't get how many civilizations in the Bible, but if you get into outside the biblical accounts, you understand that there's more than just sort of the Sumerian uh, antediluvian civilization that seemingly the Bible is around, and all of a sudden all of these other ones sort of come into play that they would have had different civilizations around the world, somewhere between four and nine, depending on which religion and mythology that you're talking about. Four and seven seem to be the more traditional uh, civilizations, and these were all cult centers. So you can imagine uh, civilizations like Atlantis, which again has a identical story to Genesis told within it, and, and, a, and a terrific parallel polytheist account of the same story. Uh, and you can imagine civilizations like Mu, perhaps Lemuria, but that's more of a last couple hundred year inventions by the Theosophists, uh, Asgard or Thule as it comes out of North mythology, and all around the world you can imagine these civilizations. Gary, but I'm going to jump they... in here. Pardon the interruption. We're going to take a quick time out. We'll come back. It sounds like there may have been a bargain uh, in the works. Uh, in some cases, maybe the women were taken by force, but in others, maybe they were given away in exchange for something. We'll talk about that. Gary Wayne, the author of The Genesis 6 Conspiracy, right here on The Conspiracy Show. Don't go away. Take a look around. What do you really see? This is where you can tell all about it. The Conspiracy Show with Richard Sarrett on Zoomer Radio. Gary Wayne is with us, the author of The Genesis 6 Conspiracy. So, in some cases, were the women taken by force by the fallen angels? And in some cases, was there uh, maybe a dowry or, a, or some sort of a bargain uh, made, you know, in exchange for being married to, I'm sure these fallen angels were, you know, handsome, uh, you know, as Lucifer was, the shining one. Uh, so I mean, was there a deal struck? Well, I, I think there were, and it goes sort of hand in hand in terms of when and how they were created. And so what we're told in, in Enoch is that uh, Satan leads them to Mount Hermon. Of course, Mount Hermon is in the Bible, and it's the region of Bashan. And so this is where it's thought that the first incursion uh, took place. And then there would have been other incursions because we're told that, you know, they took any anybody they chose, took any wife that they chose. And I think that they chose quite often because... Uh, they, you know, it says that they were created these created these giants then and then afterwards. We don't know whether that is in, you know, for all the years until the flood came, there was multiple recreations, and or that is referencing a second incursion after the flood. But we know it took place more than once, and we know they chose the wife. So whether or not they were forced, or some of them volunteered, that's not clear in the Bible, but when you get outside the Bible, there is this understanding that um, if the angels could take any form that they want, they could make themselves very appealing to uh, women to entice them to have sex. And secondly, they tended to offer knowledge and power for being their wives to produce these babies, although I'm not convinced they were rewarded from that in a physical sense because we're told, and particularly in the in the Kebra Nagast, which talks about, uh, which is the Ethiopian Old Testament for people not familiar with the Kebra Nagast, it talks about the birth of these babies, and they were so large that they couldn't be delivered through normal manners, and so they did sort of a barbaric cesarean delivery that caused the death of the mothers. And so I think there was initially where they were enticed through knowledge and perhaps that these angels were very appealing in terms of how they could have changed their form to do that, but they weren't able to sort of reap the reward from that because it sounds like they died from the Kebra and the gas. And that makes sense if they're trying to uh, deliver these monstrous sized babies because giants would have been, you know, giant babies as, as well. So I think 
um, what it, what was going on here is that um, for the most part they forced the women to, to, to be part of their harems for, for reproduction afterwards. Uh, and yet we see uh, these civilizations like Sumeria that seem to spring out of nowhere. I mean, on the timeline, everyone else is still living in mud huts, crawling out of the trees, and yet in Sumeria we see, we see libraries, we see agricultural techniques that far surpassed, I mean, everything, everyone else were hunter-gatherers. So there must have been some sort of a knowledge exchange. Yeah, and if you look at whether or not it's Sumeria or any of the ancient civilizations, and particularly free, uh, pre-flood, but then again, again, it happens after the flood, they accredit all of their knowledge and civilization to the gods, that they delivered this knowledge. And so what we understand through secret societies, and particularly the Rosicrucians and the ancient Masons, is that Although the descendants, uh, you know, of the original humans were taught um, the basic seven uh, liberal arts or the seven sacred sciences, as they call it, was only after the gods injected the illicit knowledge from heaven that sent this civilization on a fast track to, to knowledge, technology, and development. And so all of the different accounts are, are pretty congruent in, in that there's a certain point where this happens. We don't get a lot coming out of archaeology other than the Sumerian um, civilization that just explodes without any sort of history before for writing or a development of writing or the development of the agricultural skills or the astronomical skills or the building skills to build these great um, megalithic buildings to worship the, the gods. So all of this is accredited to go back to the gods, as I said earlier. And... We also have ruins both below the ocean and above the ocean that seem to be antediluvian as well all around the world. So uh, I would say the places like Machu Picchu, um, probably most of the the uh, Kishamaya and Aztec ruins would be antediluvian as well. And they'll tell you they inherited those buildings and those structures and the gods built them. Just as the gods were credited for building most of the structures in Sumeria. And then you have um, the pyramids in Egypt. And I know the standard chronology is about 23 to 2400 BC um, with Kephra. But there are with the uh, there are some relics if i can put it that way or uh, um i'm trying to think of uh, the right word but anyways um we'll call it a relic for lack of a better word right now artifact uh, artifact that's the word that i'm looking for uh where you have this 52 degree sloped uh pyramid depicted at about 3000 bc which is um and that's on the tablet of of uh, narma and uh so we have a predating before the 2400 for, for, for the pyramids, which again goes back to a lot of other accounts that these were built in the time before the flood. So um, this knowledge definitely comes from the gods and explains a whole bunch of different things where they go, you know, human beings seemingly go from hunters and gatherers to a civilized civilization without any logical answers to it. Now, do we have... Any idea as to, you know, what percentage of the world's population were hybrids at this point? In the, in, you know, when we're talking about the Old Testament, let's say pre-flood. Yeah, we don't have any idea. What we do know is some of the accounts, that when you look at the Manichaean Book of Giants, and there's a publication out that's part of that, series um, that goes back, I think, to as, as they date that back to the Book of Giants, which is part of the Enoch series. Um, there are hundreds of thousands of these giants that, that come about. Um, so we don't know how many there were, but they fought these great wars. And all the accounts uh, around the world talk about this war of these giants against the gods. So they get so arrogant and so proud and so powerful, they actually think they can overthrow the gods. But that's why the flood comes in all of the different polytheist accounts, which is very, very similar to 
you know, what the Bible talks about. So I think there was, my speculation would be is, is there probably would have been millions of these demigods. And, uh, you know, they turned against uh, humankind um, and turned against themselves. And in the Greek account with, uh, in Crataeus and uh, Timaeus, uh, you have Plato talking about this war where you have a ten-nation empire of these giants of Atlantis um, that is trying to take over the whole world. Um, now they're stopped by Hercules and other what they would call good giants in, in the polytheist duality part of the religion uh, from the antediluvian Greek civilization. And so the Athenians are the ones given credit for defeating uh, the Atlantean Empire. Um, but this, this is what the Greeks is, would have called the Battle of the Titans. Yes, exactly. And we know that these are the same types of beings because you have uh, the Titans, which are known as gods or the ones of heaven and also uh, of the earth, just as Atlas is the uh, offspring of Poseidon and or Iapetus, depending on which version you're reading, or Clido and Clymene. He is also a hero, and the heroes were the beings like Theseus and Hercules and Perseus and all these other accounts that you get coming out of, out of Greek mythology, and they and they were giants. And so we, we, we do have uh, an understanding that these were the same type of beings that are talked about in, in the Genesis account. Right. And... And st sticking with the, uh, the Greek pantheon for a moment, was Zeus... Uh, was he a fallen angel or was he a Nephilim? Well, that's where you get into that word of titans of heaven and titans of the earth or the Anunnaki in the Sumerian pantheon of heaven and the Anunnaki of, of earth and the different levels of the gods. So there's a high, definite hierarchy and there's also what they call the parent gods. So in Greek mythology, you would have had Kronos and Gaia and uh, a number of other gods that would be known as the parent gods. And then Zeus would be one of the offspring and part of the Mount Olympus gods. And you get sort of the same understanding in um, Egypt, Egyptian mythology and religion with the Ogdo gods, which uh, gods like Ra would have been part of, and then Osiris, which would be very much similar to Zeus or Zeus, uh, would be part of that second level. And those would be all offsprings of gods mating with, with gods. And so there would be the lower level of gods. All right, I've got, a, in, I've got to a jump in here again. We'll take a quick time out. We'll come back and continue to discuss... The Genesis 6 Conspiracy with Gary Wayne, right here on The Conspiracy Show. My name is Richard Serrett. Don't go away. You're listening to The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett from Zoomer Radio. Welcome back. Gary Wayne, author of The Genesis 6 Conspiracy, is with us for the full two hours. And we were talking about the uh, the Greek pantheon. I just wanted to circle back to the Old Testament for a moment. And I remember as a child, I was always confused, as I'm sure many young Christians were, why the God of the Old Testament seemed so wrathful. He was constantly ordering the Israelites to go into this village and smite, to kill every man, woman, and child. And that just did not, I couldn't reconcile that with the loving God of the New Testament. And some some people claim, uh, you know, that oh well, it's that's because it's two separate gods, and I, I never, I never bought into that, of course. But in light of the fact that there, the, you know, the gene pool was so contaminated, and you know, there was there were millions of giants running around. Is that what God was ordering the Israelites to destroy? These hybrids? They were demons, right? Well, I wouldn't call them demons from my understanding. Um, the demons would be the um, bodiless spirits of the original Nephilim that come out of Genesis 6 and are killed before the flood and or with the flood, and their spirits aren't permitted to go to sleep or into heaven, and they continue to, to wander the earth uh, in dry places and almost thirst to possess human bodies, which is what Jesus is talking about in the New Testament. 
And you know that in Greek mythology from uh, the hero worship. So it all roots to the same thing. But what's going on after the flood is, again, we get these Raphaim-type beings that are showing up after the flood um, who are very much similar to the, the Nephilim, maybe not with the same immortal spirit and maybe not as large, but still giants nonetheless. And they are congregating in, in large numbers in the covenant land, in God's land that he has um, set aside for himself and for his nation, which is Israel. And they're waiting there in ambush to wipe Israel from the face of the earth. And so these beings that are living there, the Raphaim, and, and by the many different names I named earlier, they are also intermarrying with the Canaanites. So you've got two levels of beings. One is a... Um, is the uh, Raphaim giants, and then there's a little bit more diluted bloodline of the hybrids that are uh, intermarried with, with the Canaanites. And in the Canaanite genealogy, you've got all of these different names other than Heth and Sidon, uh, which are the sons of Canaan, but you've got like the Amorites and the Hivites and on and on and on who don't have a patriarch's name, and all the names in the Table of Nations have a patriarch. That's likely because daughters of Canaan, Sidon, and Heth, um, who produced the Hittites, uh, that's Heth, uh, would have married a patriarch of the Raphaim and created, like the Amorites and, and all the other nations that are listed as, as Canaanite families of, of nations. And so these were the nations that occupied the land with the Anakim and the Avim and the Horim and the Hivim and the Rephaim, and these are all the nations that Israel are going to have to encounter without having the ability to manufacture chariots and, and smelters for iron and heavy shields, and they're going to go up against these powerful giant armies, hybrid giants, and humans occupying the land who have all of these other weapons. And so they're there to uh, prevent uh, the giants from... Uh, wiping them, you know, the newly formed nation state of Israel from the face of the earth, and Israel is tr is going to take the land from these beings who have waited for them to show up so that they can slaughter them, and so this is the the that big overarching war that's going on, and they're told not to leave any survivors of these of these people who have polluted the land in terms of their polytheism and the degradation of, of their idols and, and, and the things they would have said against the God of the, of the universe um, so that they're not going to affect Israelites going forward. Unfortunately, Israel doesn't follow that through completely and they leave survivors and it comes back around and you see this as part of the Israelite history until their diaspora in 721 with the Assyrians and then with the Babylonians um, in 587 to 89 and then again uh, with the Romans uh, after they reject their, their Messiah. So, I've just got about uh, maybe 30 seconds here but if if someone was the descendant of an Nephilim uh, and intermarried with the Canaanites or whomever, but intermarried with humans, because that person has, I guess, the the DNA of, of the fallen angels and their ancestry, does that mean that they are beyond redemption? Well, many, many people say so. I don't believe that. I believe that Jesus' atonement is greater than all of the sins in the world except for a deliberate violation against the laws of creation. So that if you have that bloodline or that DNA or that gene of ISIS, as they like to call it, um, that doesn't preclude you from salvation. It's your free choice to choose God and Jesus uh, for your own salvation. And if you do, those sins would be forgiven. All right, we'll uh, take another time out, come back, continue discussing the Nephilim, the bloodline of the Nephilim, and how they are still among us and ready to enslave humanity. Back with more of The Conspiracy Show, my name is Richard Serrett. Stay with us. Different views make great conversation. This is The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett on Zoomer Radio. To speak with Richard live, call 416-360-0740 or toll free at 1-866-740-4740. We're back with Gary Wayne, the author of 
the Genesis 6 Conspiracy. First, first how do we get a hold of the book, Gary? Well, you can get a hold of my book uh, through my website, uh, genesis6conspiracy.com. That's genesis6 with the number 6conspiracy.com. And on that website, I give a generous example of all 98 chapters so you can get a good feel for the book. And you can buy a signed copy from me there, or you can link over to amazon.ca or to amazon.com or on barnesandnoble.com or over to the Kindle version in both the U.S. and in Canada. In Canada, the book is uh, has been stocked by Chapters and Indigo, so um, it's not in all of the stores there, but if you wanted to order it through them, it's uh, one of their stocking books. And it's also distributed in the U.S. Uh, by Bookmasters, so it's available to all the retailers down there. So again, if they don't have it on the shelf and you wanted to support your local bookstore, just have them order it from Bookmasters. Let's talk a little bit about the flood and the reason for the flood. Moses and his family are described sort of as the last pure blood. Is that is that accurate? Is that what was going on, that they were preserved because they had no Nephilim blood in them whatsoever? Well, that's how we, I think that's why we get the genealogy coming down for Noah, uh, so that we know that his genealogy goes right back to Seth, and we don't see inter, any intermarriage in there in that direct descendancy. And so we presume then that the wives would have the same pure blood uh, within the Sethian line and, and no uh, crossbreeding going on in the mix. We're not told that. We're not told whether, you know, who's, who the wives' names are and what their genealogy is. But that seems to be that what God is doing is, is trying to start the new world free from that contamination within the human genome and to give every, everyone a second chance. But I would also suggest that uh, the whole world was corrupted. And, you know, the word corrupt in, in Genesis 6 is shakath, and that means to destroy, to decay, to ruin. And when it says the whole world was corrupted, that's more than just the violence that most people take for the cause of the flood. I think that is all the the animal genome, you've got the Nephilim, you've got all these other crazy beings and in, 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 um, prehistory coming out of the other accounts around the world in religions and mythologies. And I think it includes the plant genome. And I also think that that's why God perhaps calls the animals to the ark, because he knows the ones that aren't uh, contaminated to restart um, afresh again after the flood with no, with the eight on the ark of Noah's family and then the selected animals that he brings to the flood. So, yes, I think they have a pure genealogy. I mean, you mentioned the animals. Is that because there were, I mean, from ancient times we have these legends of, you know, the griffin, for example, which is uh, part lion, I guess, part eagle. Yeah, these, they, they seem to be like chimeras. Were, was, were the... the um, the fallen angels or the Nephilim, were they experimenting with the, with the animal genome? Were they combining different animals to create new beasts and creatures? I think that's part of the uh, knowledge and technology that's being supplied. And I also think that there's a procreation that's going on. And what's really interesting about the procreation, I mean, you get all of these beings, whether they're centaurs, and they're kind of created in a crazy way in a cloud um, but still you have a, a cross of a human and a, uh, a horse in that case. And uh, there's just so many different accounts of these chimera type of beings, and that's the term being used today to create uh, crossbred or cross-pollinated with DNA and um, uh, beings, is that I think that was going on. But even more to that, you have, like the Anunnaki had a raven or a bird, Head as Horus did. And you get these accounts all around the world, like the Tengu, for example, of these Nephilim type beings that had a bird type of head. Or you've got these lion warriors uh, that come out of prehistory. Again, you have gods with lion heads in all these different accounts around the world. And the watchers. Uh, were seraphim who had the face of a serpent. They were called fiery serpents, as you take that back to Hebrew, and it's thought that their offspring looked just like them in the first generations. And so you had these uh, all sorts of giant beings with these animal-like looks that, you know, were dominating the royal dynasties both before and after the flood. And that imagery 
still goes with the royal families even today. You, you see dragons and you see lions and these types of things in these coats of arms. So I think this was very widespread. And after the flood, how did the giants, how were they able to return after the, the gene pool, if you will, was supposedly uh, sort of you know, chlorinated? How did they get back? Yeah, and there's there's no agreement on this, and we don't have a smoking gun verse other than Genesis six tells us that um, after you know when the, the sons of God go to human females again, and afterwards, a lot of people also say that that means that there's a second incursion. We don't get that out of the Bible, but it makes the most sense. And so I think there was the original incursion. Uh, and those impassioned angels went to the abyss, and then there was another incursion on Mount Hermon or in Sodom again um, that created giants again after the flood. The other ways we would have to go into polytheism, um, where you get different accounts, let's say like uh, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, where you have Utmat Tishtin, who is a classic Anunnaki archetypical demigod, two-thirds uh, God and one third human, and all of his family are giants. And this seems to be a similar story to the Noah story, but different on the details, but a Nephilim survival story on an ark. So, in that bucket, you've got people on an ark somehow off the world in the earth, but somehow angels would have uh, saved them to get into the, the post diluvian world. And then other people, which I'm not a fan of, but I think it's a possibility. Um, is that the wives carried the DNA or somehow there was a stowaway on the ark. Uh, I go with second incursion just because it's just, you don't have to uh, fit uh, scripture around that, around the concept. Now, the the giants that were vanquished, of course, we have the, uh, the story of uh, David, the shepherd boy, later to become king of Israel, uh, destroying or killing uh, Goliath. Uh, at, at some point, the giants are either are killed off or driven out of the Holy Land. Uh, and then we have reports, archaeological reports and so forth, of giants showing up in the New World uh, or in places like Peru and South, all over South America. Did they, did they get on, on, on ships and sail uh, west? What do you think happened to the giants? Well, yeah, there's, that's a big question. And so what we do know is, is they are pushed out of the covenant land. We also know, and as I stated earlier, they also start the dynasties. And there's fewer and fewer of these giants as humans are moving all over the place to wipe them from the face of the earth. So they're going to intermarry to keep their bloodlines going with humans and to keep their bloodlines pure to create the metallic dynasties that are talked about in the book of Daniel that are sort of the seeds, as we understand it, Western civilization to the European dynasty. So we have a migration that comes out of the Middle East and into Europe um, that are going to form those dynasties. And out of that is a related account that's the Tuatha Danan. And these are the ones who escape out of Tartarus in the accounts, and Tartarus is located in these accounts in Scythia, uh, and they migrate south after the flood uh, into um, the Promised Land in the Middle East. They march north to settle up the Danube and into Russia, Sweden, and Norway, and over to England uh, in another direction and wave uh, and Ireland. And so you have blonde hair, blue-eyed survivors, of giants with pale skin, and you have pale skin, red hair, hazel eyed giants. And it's thought that many of these red haired ones were the ones, for the most part, that migrated to North America after that, because whether it's the North American accounts and archaeology, uh, or it's the South American ones with the, uh, the Peru skulls um, that are being discovered now, they have this red hair that goes along uh, with the discoveries. And the DNA is taking that back to Scythia. Um, now, this isn't something that we, you know, we can find in the Bible, but it does make sense when you look at the other polytheist accounts around the world in terms of Scythia as being that sort of epicenter for where these giants start after the flood. All right, we will uh, take a time out here. We're approaching the top of the hour. Gary Wayne will stay with us into the next hour right here on The Conspiracy Show. 
Thanks for inviting me into your home, long haul truck, RV, camper, taxi, your parents' well-appointed rec room, your loft, that greasy spoon just off the interstate, and your cabin in the woods. A big howdy to all of you listening in on our flagship station, Zoomer Radio, AM 740 and 96.7 FM here in Toronto. Hi to those of you listening in on one of our affiliate stations across North America. And hey, you streaming us at uh, zoomerradio.ca and those of you streaming us on our YouTube channel, Strange Planet. However, and wherever you're listening, I bid thee the warmest of welcomes and I thank you for your fine company. Gary Wayne is the author of The Genesis 6 Conspiracy and he is with us for the full two hours. Just a quick programming note, next week, Dr. Elena Gabor, past life regression therapist and author of Home at the Tree of Life, will be here for the full two hours, and we will be live streaming next week. Uh, We are talking about the Nephilim, the offspring, hybrids of fallen angels and human mothers, the giants from the Bible, the men of renown of ancient times, and how the bloodline of this Nephilim are still among us, and they will rise again in the end times to enslave humanity, uh, according to my guest, Gary Wayne. So just give us, uh, as we proceed into hour two, the big picture as to why uh, why Lucifer uh, ordered the fallen angels to, to corrupt human blood, if you will. What was the end game here? Yeah, it's an extension of, and it's a very good question, but it, I believe it's an extension of the angelic rebellion, uh, which then leads to God creating the Adamites, uh, as is talked about in, in Genesis 2 with Adam and Eve. And so, I don't believe that the angels actually thought that they could defeat God. I think that they were looking to gain their own realm, because they were created immortal without the choice uh, of immortality, but only a choice to choose God and follow him or to rebel, and many of them rebelled. But they knew how powerful God was. They worked with him closely. They knew how good he was. They knew how powerful he was. And so even though the leader, Satan, would be uh, very, very powerful, as he's described in, in Isaiah and in Ezekiel and other places in, in the book. I don't think they thought they could win, but as Isaiah 14 talks about where you have where Lucifer shows up and that word goes back to hell, El, which I think is Satan's uh, original name uh, in Hebrew, um, that I think he was, as it says in Isaiah, was trying to be like God and to have his own realm to be like God, so he could raise up his throne uh, in that new realm to be like God. So I think they're trying to win um, a separation or a negotiated sort of peace where they could live on their own. And that was never going to happen. Uh, and God knew this was going to happen all along, being Alpha Omega, but now he's going to create the Adamites, who are not going to be created immortal, Uh, and are going to have very little knowledge of God, and are going to have to choose God more on faith, and in doing so will gain their immortality, uh, and will be raised above angels in the future time, and to even judge angels, because they're going to be raised uh, up to be brothers of Jesus as adopted sons of God in the future time, after the resurrection, uh, our resurrection, um, and that this will be because as a brother of Jesus... Jesus is higher than the angels is where I'm going with that concept. So what Satan and the angels are now doing is is they're saying, we're going to try and prevent this from happening. If our just if our rebellion is going to be justified, we have to bring down humankind. And so you start this series of consequences that roll forward, beginning in the Eden account, where I think Satan avatars in the cash, and we know it's not Satan who gets the punishment is the Nakash, the serpent, as uh, the serpent goes back to Hebrew in that application, you know, loses the arms and its intelligence and its speech, uh, all for uh, participating with Satan in this avatar type of effect where Satan would enter him just as he did Judas to help Judas complete the betrayal of Jesus, um, in this case to bring down Eve and then Adam. 
And so this is the first revenge. Um, and you have this series of revenge going uh, all the way through the, the Bible. And right after Eden, you get Genesis 3.15, where you learn that the seed of the serpent is going to be at odds with the seed of, of Eve. And I think that is a prophecy of what's going to happen in Genesis 6 with the seraphim, fiery serpent, angels who are going to create the Nephilim who look just like them, which is why the kings of the ancient world all look like snakes, and you have all of that cobra and serpent imagery that goes along with royalty, along with the dragon imagery of the serpent, because the seraphim had feathered wings uh, and a serpent's face, and in ancient understanding was a dragon was a flying serpent, in this case a heavenly dragon serpent, uh, and just like you would have, let's say, Quetzalcoatl as being a plume serpent or a feathered serpent with the Kisha Maya or the Nagas in India. So you have these serpent-type beings that are now going to be coexisting as hybrids with human beings, and they bring down the antediluvian world. And then you have these giants again showing up after the floods. So you have this complete series of, of uh revenges and attempts to bring humankind down, including destroying Israel, which is why they waited in ambush in the land of the covenant, so that they couldn't bear the Messiah, because uh, with the advent of Jesus being born, you have his resurrection, and that officially ends the uh, angelic rebellion, just as First Peter uh, 319, this, we have Jesus talking to these impassioned, rebellious angels while he's still in the grave, basically, I think, telling them that when he rises on the Sunday, his, the rebellion is officially over and they're going to be sentenced to the lake of fire. And I don't believe the angels, because they don't know everything, even as powerful as Satan is, he is not as powerful as God. They did not realize or anticipate the resurrection. And so when you start to put that into context with prehistory and history, and then forward to the end time, things start to make a lot more sense. But they, they did, it sounds, or at least Lucifer did, uh, realize that Jesus was coming. There would be this birth of the Messiah. And so was were they was the game here to purposely corrupt the gene pool in order in order to forestall the birth of Jesus, or was it simply to kill the Israelites and destroy, let's say, the line of Judah, uh, the tribe of Judah, the line of David, and so there never would be a, a, a Jesus? I would say all of the above, uh, because they're so desperate to to win that, and so they de- definitely want to wanted to corrupt the gene pool so that maybe God would move forward to wipe everybody out again. It might be one of the thoughts that they would have had. But they also wanted to prevent the Messiah from coming, which is why they wanted to wipe Israel out. And then he wants to kill uh, the Messiah um, as a baby um, as Jesus is being born and, and shortly thereafter. And then you have, you know, the resurrection, which puts puts an end to this. So all of what they're doing is is trying to either wipe Israel from the face of the earth, or prevent the Messiah from coming, and or by wiping Israel from the face of the earth through the Amalekim, which is part of the Rephaim breed, and the uh, son of uh, Eliphaz and Timnah, um, who are. Uh, Eliphaz is the son of uh, Esau, who is the brother of Jacob, who in, who becomes Israel and inherits all of the blessings and the birthrights. And he's the older son who doesn't get those birthrights and Messianic blessing. He is trying to wipe out through Amalek uh, and Malachim down the road uh, Israel as they come out of Egypt. And that's the first battle that happens out of Egypt. So they're trying to also usurp those uh, blessings that Israel is going to get so that they can add that in and graft it in, as you say, a a polluted uh, DNA or bloodline into the dragon messiah that they want to present in the end time um, as the, as, as the dragon messiah. So the, the bloodline of the Nephilim continues uh, through this time, through, let's say, the, the period of, of the New Testament, but there aren't physical giants running around, correct? So how, why is that? Why, where were the giants? Well, when we look at what happens with the, uh, the royal dynasties and their 
sort of cousins and wider family, which becomes the nobility and the elite, is that if you continue to intermarry in a small gene pool, which they did, and you know that's why you have all of these queens coming from princess princesses coming from other dynasties and intermarrying and staying, um, whether it's from the Mesopotamian to the Egyptian or to the Malachim or to the Hittites or even down what they do throughout modern history where you have intermarriage between the royal families, they need to bring in diluted levels of bloodlines to regenerate uh, the bloodline to prevent diseases like um, hemia, uh, um, I'm trying to think Hem- of oh, the hem- uh, hemophilia. Hemophiliac disease, thank you. And um, let's say Habsburg jaw is another example. So there's a lot of, through interbreeding, a lot of diseases that they have to make sure that they don't interbreed too tightly. And the more you dilute the bloodline over time, the less you have of that original size and look of what uh, the giants originally had. So over time, I think they've lost that. A lot of people disagree with me on that and say, well, no, they have a changeling ability, but we don't really have any proof of that. But what we do know is is there's this continual dilution of that pure bloodline. And they keep their pedigrees of these genealogies right back into prehistory because the purer the bloodline, the higher the pedigree within that sort of organizational cult. And so that's why I don't. That's why I think they've lost uh, their their size and that serpentine look for the most part over time. But if you look at somebody like Akhenaten, who was a considered uh, one of the most ennobled bloodlines of that period of time, uh, 1200 to 1400 BC, depending on uh, whose chronology you're going to use. If you go to a King Tut museum and look at a statue of Akhenaten, you see the serpentine look. Uh, and he's got this protruded chin, these high cheekbones, these almost alien-like wraparound eyes, this elongated skull, um, and it, it looks like a serpent. And so I think even at that point, which would have been over a thousand years after the flood, you still see some of those traits. But over time, I think they've just sort of they've taken on more of that human-type look. So what we have is the descendants of the giants, which my book follows those bloodlines in terms of what they're doing, how they create the secret societies, and how they want to bring about this rendezvous, get their co-conspirators and creators uh, out of the abyss, and to have this war against the God of the universe. So in Jesus' time, uh, for example, the Caesars, uh, King Herod, uh, were they descended from the Nephilim? Yeah, I think so. And so Herod, he takes his bloodlines back through the Edomites uh, and back to Esau. Esau and the Edomites are the same. And he has significant Amalekim and um, Horim bloodlines that he comes out of through the Edomite kings. And again, I've got documents on all this stuff that people want to get a hold of me. Uh, I can walk, you know, you can get those documents. It'll walk you through step by step. Just get a hold of me through the website. And uh, the in the uh, Roman tradition, you have the Caesars taking over after the senators. But the senators is this are this noble class until you get the tyrants or the Caesars that come along. But the Caesars come out of that senator class and those bloodlines they all take their bloodlines back to the roman and the etruscan gods and the uh offspring that they had which were again heroes and so it's the same thing that's going on even in jesus's time and these are the same ruling class and they're going to continue to intermarry and what about the Merov- merovingian uh, bloodline that would become the frankish kings and later the kings yeah. and queens of france yeah, it's, again, as you go through history, there's these sort of crossroad kingships, as I would like to call them, that have the most noble bloodlines of that time. The Merovingians would be one of those. And they have a number of scion, and scion is an occult word where you graft in bloodlines, just as you would use that word for grafting of, of plants. But in this case, in, in noble bloodlines of particularly of the firstborn. And their bloodlines go back to uh, a number of different areas. Um, 
One is a, a distinct line of consolidation of Nephilim bloodlines of Europe and of uh of uh, the Middle East, and also they're intermarrying and grafting or scioning in those bloodlines, bloodlines from King Saul, who was the first king of Israel, and they say that comes through from two different sources, one from Mary Magdalene that I'll touch on in a second, and one from through the Sicambium Franks where you've got some Benjamites that migrate up uh, and intermarrying with the Sicambium Franks. Um, and so that's important because that gives them the rights in terms of what they say to Jerusalem because Joshua gave the Benjamites Jerusalem in the time of the Exodus. And that's why you need to follow the King of Jerusalem title if you you know want to follow some of these bloodlines and the allegories that um, they like to connect together uh, and, and display in plain sight. Uh, and I think Antichrist is going to crown himself the king of Jerusalem, just as Baldwin was the first king of Jerusalem, who is the brother of the Bullion, who's a descendant of the of Dagobert of the Merovingians, and and uh, one of the founders of the Templars, is crowned first uh, king of Jerusalem in 1118, and then it falls down through the Habsburgs, and now is in with the king of Spain through the Bourbons, who comes out of the Habsburg Lorraine bloodline. But I digress. Um, and then you have uh, the blood lines of David that they've scioned in there, and you also have what they believe to be is the bloodline of Jesus and Mary Magdalene, because they believe that Jesus didn't die on the cross, and that he was taken down. I don't believe that. This is what they believe, and they've scioned that bloodline in. So they've got all of these ennobled bloodlines that have come down as one of those great sort of th uh, crossroads of history where you've got so many noble bloodlines um, and most of the bloodlines of the royal families today will trace their bloodlines back to the Merovingians and how that bloodline gets in from Jesus and Mary Magdalene into the Merovingians go comes down through the Joseph of Arimathea and the Grail uh, literature where in, in, in their belief, Joseph of Arimathea takes Josephes, which is the third son, as they like to say, of Mary and, and Jesus after, the, after he's saved from the crucifixion. And they're going to marry into the Pendragon Celtic dynasties after settling in Glastonbury. And that's going to produce uh, a princess called Aragon, who's going to marry Aminabad of the Merovingian dynasty. So, and the amazing thing is they have all of these genealogies that they've kept track of. And a good classic example of, and, and, and to connect back in a little bit of what we are talking about earlier in the show, is the Windsors of England uh, and Prince Charles, he's on record on saying, uh, that he had his genealogies go back to Vlad the Impaler. Yes. And Vlad the Impaler was this red hair, hazel eyed character, pale skin character that the Dracula character uh, is based on. And his bloodlines go back to the Scythians as a Tuatha Danon. So that's just a classic example of how they value these genealogies and how they track them. But for those. Monarchs who claim that they can trace their bloodline back through the Merovingians, through uh, Jesus and Mary Magdalene. I, for one, I don't believe Jesus had children. I don't believe he was married to Magdalene. I don't believe he survived the crucifixion. So that, to me, is is that a deception? Are they trying to are they trying to uh, artificially graft their bloodline to the house of David? Uh, in order to gain legitimacy? Yes. Yes. It, 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 I believe it's false and alleged. They say they have the evidence and that that's how they're going to sort of bring Christianity down uh, in the end time as one of the major pieces so that they can enfold it into the universal religion. But yes, it's what they're trying to do so that they can claim um, a pedigree that is so great that nobody will dare to deny it and that um, even though they don't look at Jesus as being the son of God in Gnosticism they do believe he's a great prophet that he was an incarnation incarnation in that Christ consciousness uh, belief system just as Vishnu or Shiva incarnated many times and and it Jesus would be one of the, what the, the, they would call these enlightened prophets sent to help humankind on their path as they evolve into godhood. 
I don't believe in any of that, but that's what they believe. And it's what they do with their belief that we need to be, that we need to understand. Again, Gary, how do people get a hold of the book? Um, best way to get a hold of the book is uh, through Amazon.com, Amazon.ca, or Barnes & Noble, or you can go to my website at the Genesis 6 conspiracycom and get a signed copy or link over to any of those um, places that I just mentioned and or get a link into the Kindle version. Right. All right. Let's uh, take another time out. We'll come back and uh, continue to discuss the bloodline of the Nephilim and how they will rise again to enslave humanity. Gary Wayne, my guest for the full two hours, the author of The Genesis 6 Conspiracy, right here on The Conspiracy Show. My name is Richard Serrett. Stay with us. Question everything. This is The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett on Zoomer Radio. Shaking the world and seeing what falls. This is The Conspiracy Show with Richard Sarrett from Zoomer Radio. We're back with Gary Wayne, the author of The Genesis 6 Conspiracy. Uh, So these uh, kings, queens around the world uh, that tie their bloodline to the uh, the Nephilim, uh, which were the product of a commingling of the fallen angels and and um, human human wives. Uh, I mean, is it simply limited to royalty? Because let's face it, monarchs are on their way out. Uh, more and more countries around the world. There are a few holdouts. Most are becoming republics. Um, so. Where else do we find the descendants or the bloodline of the Nephilim? It's a very, very good question. And uh, it's it's very, very true that the visibility of the royal families aren't there. I mean, we have, you know, the English crown, but they're just not visible and showing that visible control everywhere. And over the last hundred years, they've stepped a little bit more further back and into the background. Uh, but still controlling things. And they have a whole series of orders within the royal families, whether or not it's the, uh, you know, the Rolo bloodlines that go back to the gods of Odin, which is the Seraphim uh, order, or it's uh, any of the other uh, orders that, uh, they, that the royal families have uh, through, throughout Europe. These are the orders that control, you know, the lower level orders of uh, of secret societies. And the conduit is the Rosicrucians, where you have the upper half of the Rosicrucians being the purebloods uh, who report up the ladder to um, these other orders. And it goes something like, uh, like this. So the Rosicrucians report to the um, Committee of 300, which reports to the Council of 33, which reports to the family of the 13 families. And then intersecting in those top layers, you have all of these royal blood orders. Um, and so they control the world through their organization. So they're not very visible, but those bloodlines are still there. And they're the, the, the ancient names, um, not ancient, I guess medieval names would be a better way of saying it, whether or not it's the St. Clair family, which are the St. Clairs, who actually are that bloodline of Rollo. They changed their name to St. Clair after they expropriate Normandy from the French, French in about 911 AD. Uh, you've got names like uh, de Bouillon, de Payon, and Anjou, who were uh, founding members of the Knights Templar who were the descendants of the last Mer- Merovingian survivor, Dagobert, uh, of, of, the Ange- of the Lorraine region. Um, and the Anjou produced the Plantagenet, which most of the presidents take their genealogies back to, to through uh, King, um, King John of the Magna Carta, and that was the Plantagenet uh, dynasty at that point in time. You have um, families like... Uh, the Habsburg Lorraine, which is an intermarriage of the Anjou out of uh, Lorraine into the Habsburg dynasty. Um, you've got the Stuart 
uh, family, which is uh, at that point in time now becomes the unicorn family, which is, again, the most ennobled of that time. You've got the Bourbons of Spain, who I mentioned, who have the King of Jerusalem title today, and on and on and on. These are families that are in the background who are still pulling the strings. And who stands, uh, I mean, is there a bloodline that, that stands in opposition? For example, I don't know, I'm just blue-skying it here, but Jesus had a half-brother. Uh, his father, Joseph, had a family before. So there was James, who I became, I believe became uh, the first bishop of, of Jerusalem and was martyred. Uh, I mean, do they have, is there a bloodline there that is preserved and, and that stand in opposition to the, the Nephilim? Well, what happens is that these uh, groups of people, they are drafting Jesus' family and Jesus and John the Baptist in as a scenes into their bloodline and organization, falsely, I believe. The family of Jesus is called the Despacini, and uh, they, we do know that they're still active in the church, and actually when... Constantine is uh, uh, setting up Christianity as the state-sponsored uh, religion of Rome, which I think he also mix in a lot of Mithraism, but that's another rabbit hole. You have the Despacini who are actually uh, petitioning to move the center for the Christian church back to Jerusalem. They don't win that argument, but they're visible then. But because they've been drafted in by the polytheists, it's part of that scion of the bloodlines that they have have also used for their pedigree. So the, um, the kings and queens, the, I mean, do they all, without exception, have, I mean, you can't get into the club, right, unless you have Nephilim blood. But is that the idea? For the most part, they're all going to have a pedigree that is going to be acceptable, or they're going to have a pedigree where they're going to be used to ha- uh, to reintroduce or a refreshing of the bloodline. You know, we're seeing, let's say, with the Windsors in England, um, more of that bloodline that's a little bit further out but i think in any of the bloodlines you're going to have to find something that's probably connected back i wouldn't you know say that none of them would go rogue on that but as a general rule you need to have that pedigree to be in the club absolutely um and it's just you you don't have standing within that world unless you've got a pedigree that is important to what extent uh do we all have Nephilim blood in us? I mean, is, and is there a particular blood marker? Yeah, that's a very good question. And in my book, I don't specifically talk about that uh, a whole lot in terms of the blood, but I talk all around it just because we can't prove it. But what seems to be the blood is uh, the marker is the RH negative bloodline. And Typically, the royals have uh, Rh negative blind, uh, blood, and so the Windsors is O negative, which is the most sought after uh, blood. Now, that's only in about fifteen percent of the population in the world, so it's not the dominant. Rh positive would be more dominant, uh, but you get a concentration of this bloodline in. Uh, France and, and, and in England where the percentages go up significantly in, in parts of France, you know, it's going to be like, you know, 20 to 25 percent. The most concentrated levels of RH negative is in the Basques. And they uh, settled in southwest France where the Templars settled, where uh, King of Septimania was, uh, where the Cathars and the Abyssinians were, and sort of the area of rebellion, if I can put it that way, an epicenter of, of rebellion. And the Basques believe that they are the most pure of the bloodlines. Now, they had a falling out with the bloodlines that moved out of Europe, and they have the Basque diaspora, but they believe that they are the Homo Atlantis. This is their belief, and um, I'm sure not every Basque believes this, but this, this is their mythology and their belief system. And that what they talk about when they say they're Homo Atlantis is they were the survivors after the flood who settled in uh, northwest Spain uh, and in southwest France, and uh, then also started the civilization of Egypt, the civilization of Mesopotamia, and not without coincidence from what we've talked about earlier, 
the Scythian civilization, and that they are the most noble bloodline in the world. But again, they've had a falling out with with the other bloodlines that moved out of out of Europe. So that's the Rh negative bloodline, and people who have Rh negative bloodline, you know, they are grouped with a lot of science and research that, you know, then this is sort of a, uh, a mixing of, of, the, of, of many, many scientific results, but they have a higher intelligence than the average human. They average 135 plus. They say they have better analytical skills, better intuitive abilities, more psychic abilities, and on and on and on. I won't go through all of the different things that they say that come along with this in terms of that mythos, uh, but those are scientific uh, results that sort of go along with that. And so they believe in more than the blood. It's actually what they would call the gene of Isis, which is the biggest marker. So a DNA marker or a gene market marker, which they would also say is the root word for Genesis. And it's through the genes that produces the type of blood. And so that would be the true marker that I think would uh, they would be looking for to identify who the people are around the world, that they want to know who they are and what level of, of degree of purity they have as they start to bring in this new age or what we would know as Christians as the end time. All right, let's take another time out. When we come back, we'll talk about the reemergence of the Nephilim on the world stage in the end times, as you just mentioned. Back with more of my conversation with Gary Wayne, the author of The, the Genesis 6 Conspiracy, right here on The Conspiracy Show. Don't be afraid of the dark. The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett from Zoomer Radio. To talk to Richard, call 416-360-0740 or toll free 1-866-740-4740. We are back with Gary Wayne, the author of The Genesis 6 Conspiracy. Again, Gary, how do people get a hold of the book? Um, best way to get a hold of the book is uh, through Amazon.com, Amazon.ca, or Barnes & Noble, or you can go to my website at the Genesis 6 conspiracycom and get a signed copy or link over to any of those um, places that I just mentioned and or get a link into the Kindle version. At some point, I think it's in the book of Matthew, Jesus is asked about the end times, and he says that in the end times it will be as it was in the days of Noah. Is Jesus referencing the Nephilim in in that passage? It's a great question, and a lot of people think it's again it's just referencing um, the violence and or people were shocked and weren't ready for the end time, and all of that was true. But the disciples asked, "What were all of the signs of his coming in the in the end time?" And this is an overarching sign as well as those smaller details. And so uh, I think he is referencing that we need to understand the days of Noah, uh, who lived 950 years, 600 years before the flood, 350 years after the flood. And so I think we need to understand what was going on at Sodom and Gomorrah and at Babel and, uh, and with the creation of, of Israel, as well as the creation of the giants before the flood and the cause of the flood. And I think he wants us to understand that it's going to look like that with the same universal religion that they imposed through the Nephilim. This is what the end time is going to look like. And in Luke's version, he actually connects uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, which is with its destruction of fire as part of the as of Noah days of the flood, which I think is telling us that there is a second incursion. And that that destruction was fire, and just as the first apocalypse was by water, the linkage is is the uh, end times will be an apocalypse of fire, which is the description of all of the destruction for the most part that we get in the apocalypse. So I think he's directing us to learn what happened in prehistory and history so that we were not deceived for what's going to happen in the end time. And was he also specifically talking about the Nephilim taking human wives and creating this hybrid uh, offspring. In fact, some have suggested that the modern-day UFO alien abduction phenomena is a mirroring of those days of Noah. Well, I would agree with that to a certain degree. And so we don't know whether or not 
uh, we're going to have actual giants roaming around and that there are angels are going to procreate and recreate the Nephilim of old. Or it's going to be the descendants, as my book focuses more on in terms of being part of that end time alliance, just as in Daniel 243, you have the descendants of the metallic dynasties of the Rephaim after the flood, who are part of this 10 nation empire, which they're going to call the New Atlantis, which is what the Club of Rome is trying to establish around the world, uh, as we speak in groups of nations and trading blocks, etc. But anyways, these descendants are going to intermix with the seed of men. So we know there's going to be a representative of these bloodlines that are going to intermix with um, human beings in the end time. Or there's going to be a recreation. I think we need to be open to both. And or is there another way to create Nephilim? And I think it's, you know, when you are doing a violation against the laws of creation, you're doing whether or not it's DNA manipulation to do that. It's the same sort of Nephilim concept. So again, whether through alien technology or human technology, because we're able to now manipulate the DNA, it could be that we'll see the giants come in that way as well. Uh, I would also be open to the fact that if one accepts that the spirits of the Nephilim didn't die, they didn't go to sleep, and they weren't permitted into heaven, and they've been roaming just as Jesus was dealing with, like, legion and other thirsting um, uh, demon spirits at his time, that they're still out there, and that with the technology that is being developed right now, is that there could be clones or transhumanism or whatever else is going to come out of this uh, this technology where these demon spirits might be able to enter and lead sort of the armies of the end time. And or you're going to create all of these fantastic biological weapons uh, that are part animal, because you get some crazy descriptions in Revelation 9, in Joel 1 and 2, and the Gog and, and Magog war, which I think is, is, is reflective back of there's a Nephilim um, influence to that World War III that happens with that 200 million man army and after the beings come out of the abyss in Revelation 9. We just have about 10 seconds. Just give me a yes or no and we'll follow up later. Uh, so in the end times, we will see a return of actual physical giants? Somehow, some way, yes. All right, we'll leave it there and we'll pick up on the other side. As I say, Gary Wayne, The Genesis 6 Conspiracy. Stay with us. When you look at the sky, ever wonder if someone's looking back? This is The Conspiracy Show with Richard Sarrett from Zoomer Radio. To speak with Richard live, call 416-360-0740 or toll free at 1-866-740-4740. All right, we are into the home stretch with Gary Wayne, the author of The Genesis 6 Conspiracy. Uh, so the uh, the reemergence of giants in the end times. Are we talking about well, what order of giants? Are we talking about the original, you know, 30, 40 foot giants? Are we talking about more like a Goliath, nine feet tall? Yeah, I think I think the smaller version, if there's going to be giants, uh, I mean, I wouldn't rule out the other possibility, but nowhere do we get a specific Nephilim term, right, of those gigantic monsters. We get sort of the understanding with the days of Noah, we get these great and mighty men references in the New Testament. Um, we get the word gibberim being used, which is a uh, gibor, uh, and I am is the male plural, which is where the word mighty one comes from in Genesis 6 4 to describe uh, these warrior like tyrant beings uh, that are produced from. Uh, human females and, and angels, that shows up in in Joel 1 and 2, and also at, in, in 3 and 4 as you get into the Armageddon War, and it shows up again as mighty ones in the Gog and Magog War in um, Ezekiel 39 in the second chapter. 38 is, is also part of that Gog and Magog War. Uh, so I think you're going to get that as part of it, understanding that Gog and Magog were giants born from Poseidon and or Iapetus. And that uh, this, I think, is reflecting that we're going to see these giants somehow, some way. But I just don't think that they're going to be those 
monstrous ones because I think the Bible would give us that as a specific word so that we could identify it. Uh, again, I have a, a document that links this on the great mighty men that uh, Revelations talks about, so the Gibberim back in, in the Old Testament. So if people want that, get a hold of me. And are we going to see an entire army uh, descending on Israel, uh, comprised of these giants? I think they're going to be leading the army in that Gog and Magog war, Joel 1 and 2, and that 200 million man army that uh, has all of these crazy beings that are described in it, marching on Israel, yes. And I think, uh, and this is the people uh, that God is going to stand uh, and defend uh, and destroy that army, um, that is just going to utterly shock the world. And I think this is the war that as Antichrist is rising to power is going to take credit for as um, saving Israel uh, and which will then allow him to move into Jerusalem and become Antichrist and be crowned in the abomination in the temple. So this is uh, the false peace that he will, uh, yes, he will create. Yes, yes, through a false Armageddon. And... You know when I'm when I'm hearing this uh, these strange creatures and giants, uh, you know, marching against uh, Israel, it it all sounds very Tolkien esque, uh, where the uh, the orcs, these these mythical creatures, which you know they are for all intents and purposes giants, and they're sort of half human, half beast, and they seem to be uh, you know conjured up from uh, from the earth and forged in the bowels of the earth. Uh, I mean, I don't know if you you read Tolkien, or but I'm guessing he, that must have been his inspiration. Oh, there's no doubt. I mean, the whole Tolkien story of the Lord of the Rings, and the, the rings are the ring lords of the Anunnaki uh, that were awarded kingship at Nippur. Uh, it, it is a, a mix of Sumerian antediluvian mythology with the Norse mythology, and that's where you get that fairy aspect being overlaid onto this older ideology. That is absolutely a pre-flood story, and even at the end, you have all of these beings sailing away on a ship, because now it's the age of man, uh, and that is representing the flood. And so these beings that are, are orcs, they're either ogres or they're some tarp, sort of Nephilim being that he's drawing on. And, you know, whether it's Tolkien or it's Lewis, I mean, their knowledge of the occult and the occult history is absolutely astonishing. Do you see other parallels between now and the days of Noah in the terms of, in terms of uh, well, uh, let's talk about artificial intelligence, for example. Yeah, and I'm going to connect that now back to as in the days of Noah. So we talked about that knowledge earlier on in the show of how the seven sciences uh, mix with the, um, the the knowledge and the illicit knowledge from heaven from the gods and the fallen angels, and that this sent the technology on a very rapid increase, just like what we're having going on today. And I think that their technology was actually greater than what we have today is because, and I, I think that because we're not in the end time right now. And so our knowledge is still developing. And I think we're getting assistance on that development today, just as it was in the days of Noah. And I think AI is part of that illicit knowledge that's being ramped up to help bring in the end time. And you've got quantum computing, which is on the, um, you know, out there hot and heavy these days. And they're trying to marry up AI and quantum computing, and quantum computing is used to get into different dimensions, possibly where the abyss is, and possibly to uh, get um, uh, Azazel and all of his uh, compatriots out of, out of the abyss before the end time, and some people speculate that's what they're doing at CERN. And so, yeah, I think all of this is coming together, and it's also going to be part of the mark of the beast. Uh, so that when you take that mark, it's going to be somehow changes the DNA and or aspect of the body, uh, both physically and spiritually, in a way that those who take it are going to be sentenced to the lake of fire, 
just as the original Nephilim and the uh, fallen rebellious angels are going to the lake of fire. So I think when we, when I say that is part of the AI, we know you need to buy and sell and it's going to be able to control everything and watch everybody on the earth. And you're going to have also this image of the Antichrist. And I think that's where that AI sort of comes in on all of that aspect. So it's still developing, but I think that is all part of the end time beast system. I had uh, Pastor Mark Biltz on the program a couple of weeks ago, and he suggested that it's quite possible that the Antichrist himself will be a cyborg. Um, it's certainly possible, um, but he's also going to be at least human. I mean, but cyborg is part human. We do know he's going to receive a, uh, a mortal head wound, and we do know he's the one who once was, now is not, but will be again. And comes up out of the abyss. And so it's like Azazel who comes up out of the abyss. And I link him to Abaddon and Apollyon. And he's also called the son of perdition. And so I think what's going on here is is that Azazel is going to enter into um, Antichrist uh, in the end time after the fatal head wound, creating the false resurrection on his um, rise to becoming Antichrist and being crowned in the temple. And Antichrist um, is also called the son of perdition, and perdition goes back to a set of Greek words that includes Apollyon. And so that's a connection there that I think is is telling us that he's going to be working with Apollyon and Abaddon, and Abaddon also means destroyer as Apollyon. And Abad is is the word that is used in Jeremiah 51 as the destroyer, uh, and Antichrist in that prophecy is going to destroy Babylon, just as Antichrist destroys Babylon in Revelation 17 and 18 with the help of the ten kings of the end-time empire. What's really interesting about all of that is, is that Antichrist in Daniel will honor the good of forces, and that goes back to the Hebrew word amaz, and maus is rooted in a series of words that are az, 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 and like azaz and ez, which starts to lead you back into a goat um, definition, um, and all meaning for forces, fortresses, powerful warriors, things like that. And you also have Azazel coming out of Hebrew in Leviticus 16 for the word scapegoat and also rooted in the same set of words. And, of course, you put the E-L suffix on Azaz um, and you get arrived with an angelic name as in Azazel. And Abaddon and Apollyon aren't names of, of, of angels. They're just words describing destroyer. And Azazel was the destroyer of the antediluvian world. So I think you've got all of that AI stuff going on. I think you've got all of the technology, but you've still got the bloodlines um, that are going to be involved. And you've got this avatar thing uh, going on with uh, Azazel and um, and Antichrist, which brings him to the crest and pinnacle of power. Gary, I can't believe the, the two hours have flown by so quickly. I've enjoyed this immensely. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. I know we covered uh, a lot of areas, so hopefully uh, the information made sense. And uh, thank you for having me. The Genesis 6 Conspiracy, Gary Wayne. Thank you. All right, my thanks to Duncan Briggs, Ryan White, back next week with a brand new program. Until then, move over, Aphrodite. I'm coming home. Good night. <laughs>